between banking and uh, going into venture, I moved to New York and launched a fintech company that distributed financial research online. Now, a lot of people thought I was crazy. I had a nice, cushy expat package in London uh, doing banking. I worked on Netscape IPO. I was kind of in the middle of technology. And why would I leave all of that to basically make nothing for a few years and experiment with this new technology that most people thought was really not going to go many places. Um, there, there are a lot of uh, naysayers. Uh, I mean, Blockbuster is, is one of the most kind of well known of, of saying that um, the internet was not going to impact their business. And I think they just closed their their last uh, uh, store presence uh, last year. So what is it that, uh, I mean, what's the key to looking at these new technologies and figuring out where to invest, what the timeline is? And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. And, and I'll, I'll you know, use myself as, as context on what made me in 2014 say I'm going to start a new fund focused primarily on blockchain. Um, I view blockchain as part of a decentralized technology stack that also includes artificial intelligence, Internet of Things. And what you see behind me is some of the macro trends that I thought or was observing out there in the world that I thought lent itself to something like blockchain technology. As great as the Internet and mobile technology has been, uh, we still have two billion unbanked people around the world. Uh, mobile banking has helped a lot of folks. I was born in Kenya, so I, I've been kind of tracking mobile banking since 2007, uh, since M-Pesa launched in Kenya. And it was very transformative. It's added uh, millions of dollars to Kenya's uh, GDP, because for the first time, People did not have to carry cash around uh, to, to pay their suppliers, to uh, wait for customers to pay them. People could actually go out and start businesses and get paid electronically. Uh, there was less security risk because people didn't have to carry around lots of money. Um, and, and we've seen transformation all over the world in a lot of places that didn't have banking. However, um, outside of Kenya, there's really not a lot of examples where mobile banking has taken off. Why did it work in Kenya? It worked because there is a, a monopoly telecom provider that supported um, supported this mobile banking system, and, and so um, it hasn't really reached across borders. Um, and the first Bitcoin conference I went to in 2013, I immediately thought of M-Pesa, and I thought, wow, this is a way to allow M-PESA, or not necessarily M-PESA, but that model to go across borders where anyone anywhere in the world can transfer money uh, to another person with very low fees. I mean, in, in, in a place like Kenya, it costs up to 20% of a transaction. Um, so you can imagine how expensive it is for people to do business. And these are people who have the least resources, the small businesses, the individuals. And, and, and so I just thought of that transformative power. But then I went one step further. I thought, well, when we all started using smartphones, think about how much more time we started spending. Um, and, and not only spending on our smartphones and on different applications, but allow all these companies to gather data on us. Our digital crumbs, uh, I call them, are uh, left everywhere we go. Uh, every, every kind of step is being tracked. And so there's an opportunity for new business models to emerge from that data. But then we've also seen, and it's been highlighted over the last year, that companies have not kept our data secure. Stored in, in servers, there's not good operational security around our data. I mean, the companies frankly don't care as long as they're making profits. I thought, the more I dug into blockchain technology, I thought this can address first the proliferation of data and then the security and 
of that data, so it doesn't reside in, in one place. And then I start thinking of artificial intelligence. So these two zettabytes of data that, that's kind of being created, um, I, I think it's almost on a daily basis right now. Um, wouldn't it be great if we didn't get power to just companies like Facebook and Google, who have these large data sets, these large artificial intelligence uh, uh, teams that can actually crunch through that data and offer new products and services. What if we allowed any entrepreneur out there to have access to data sets, but anonymized data sets, where if I knew there was a, a, a small company working on a groundbreaking clinical trial, I can say, you know, I'm, I want to permission my data out to that company. But I don't want the big pharmas to get that data. Or I'll say, I'll take pieces of my health history and donate that, but then I want to charge for other pieces of my health history. And so in that way, I thought we can kind of democratize artificial intelligence and stop giving power to the companies that have been collecting the data and not giving us anything back where I can decide who I want to give that data to. Um, and I can also enable companies that may care a little bit more about impact or care about my concerns in exchange for that data. So that was another kind of thought process I was going through. So this whole idea of Bitcoin as currency, I started thinking about data as currency based on all the data that's being collected and will continue to be collected by the <coughs> like 24 billion IoT devices expected uh, in the next few years. Sensors are coming down in cost, uh, more smartphones out there in the world. And processing power, I mean, that's been a key. I started, um, when I said I started off Venture in 99, it was at Intel Capital, uh, the largest semiconductor company in the world, and was doing semiconductor investments as well as software investments, and I saw Moore's Law, which shows that the, the cost of processing power uh, gets halved um, every few years, and I was thinking, all of these combinations of technology and market forces, globalization, made it the right time for blockchain technology. And as an early stage investor, it's really all about timing. You can see the best technology, but if it's too early, it's too early. It's not going to see the light of day. So it, it's the assessment of, of the tech and getting excited about the tech and its potential, but evaluating a team that understands the constraints of the current market, that understands that adoption is not necessarily going to happen overnight. And this is the issue I had with the market in 2017, when everybody discovered cryptocurrency, everyone discovered initial coin offerings, but they kind of forgot about the history of technology adoption. If you look at Amazon being created in 1995 as an online bookseller, had a nice run uh, during the late 90s, IPO, uh, lost 80% of its value during the whole dot-com crash and had to rebuild since then it's business. Think about pets.com. Great idea. I mean, everybody buys uh, all sorts of things on the web right now, and then there are lots of uh, companies that provide pet products. But the infrastructure was not yet there from a payments, from a security, from just a broadband perspective. I mean, if you're around in the early days of the internet and the dial-up was really slow, um, when I hear people talking about how blockchain or Bitcoin is not going to, or other, other blockchains aren't going to get anywhere because of scalability issues, I just go right back to thinking about the early internet. Very few people wanted to use it. I remember I was excited about the technology because I'm an early adopter and I'm an early investor. Um, but
But I remember talking to relatives, even other bankers I worked with, who, who just said, you know, oh, why would I use an email when I can pick up the phone and call someone? So I go back to all those arguments, and, and I can tell you five, six years ago when I got into this space, <laughs> there were a lot more back then because people just associated Bitcoin with money laundering. Um, and, and, um, and people just wondered why I would bet even my career on this emerging sector, or what they considered wasn't even an emerging sector. And it was that context of seeing what had happened before. I mean, and and what, what amazes me is it wasn't that long ago that we can use those examples, but then bubble activity mentality takes over. However, what I'm excited about, and what we saw with that bubble activity, is that it happened very quickly. Um, and, and partly because it's way more global than the internet was, we had open source developers around the world developing on this technology. That didn't exist in the early internet days. We also had a complete lack of regulation. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing, but we saw all this experimentation, and then we saw a lot of scammers come in, and then we saw regulators move very quickly to start addressing what was going on in the market. Um, and, and so I believe, and if this is an eye chart, but and you don't have to read it all, but it's really how the evolution of technology happens. You have the early days where it's early adopters, rise of uh, participation, and then the road bus, the path to mass adoption. And I'd say that's the stage we're at right now. We saw the road bus in 2017 and 18, and we'll continue to see them for the next few years. A lot of these early companies are not going to make it. We don't know which ones will and won't. And frankly, that's why I run a portfolio. Early stage investors need to have a diversified portfolio, 20 to 30 companies because we can't predict what that adoption curve is going to look like. We know the trends, we, we get to know the teams, we get to know the technology, and I live in Ravis pretty much seven days a week, and, um, and I can tell you there's never been anything I've seen in the tech world with a velocity of change and new information and new development as I've seen in this space. And so I do think we're going to get through these cycles much quicker. But one thing we will not get through too quickly is that mass adoption piece. Because the 20th century was built on intermediaries. Everything we know is about intermediaries. Um, banking, media, even Uber, a lot of the business models created on the mobile web they're still intermediaries. They may be slightly more efficient intermediaries than anything we've had before, or give us more access. They're still intermediaries. So this whole concept of going peer to peer for the mass market is not something that people are going to buy into, or the fact that a computer is verifying our transactions. I don't know how many times I've spoken, and people still say, but who's verifying it? Even though, we explain the technology and the fact that the computer, the computers are validating this. It's still a really hard thing to get our arms around. Um, when, when we've had these trusted intermediaries, which have lost our trust over time, but they're still considered trusted intermediaries. And this is also why we invest globally, because <coughs> it's easier for people who don't have that background, who haven't dealt with these intermediaries, to make that leap, just like mobile banking. It took a long time for mobile banking to take off here in the United States, um, from the time I started tracking it in the late 90s. It took off so quickly, within a year, a year and a half in Kenya. And why is that? Because people didn't have any other options. So most of the world doesn't have intermediaries. And we'll see some of the most interesting business models 
really true business models come from some of these regions. And we're already starting to see that. So I am out of time, but I would just leave you with, you know, I, I get asked all the time, are you, know, are you less optimistic given what's happened over the last year, the fact that ICOs crash, that all these scaling issues are happening around uh, blockchain, or enterprise adoption hasn't been as quick as people expected it to be. I would say I'm even more excited because of what I'm seeing on the ground and the fact that we're seeing failures. Failures are a good thing because there's going to be lots of failures. But we're learning as we go along. And any every major project that shuts down, there's a lot of learnings from that. And, and that's what I look at as an investor. And I do think we're going to see new models emerge, micro-insurance, a lot of access to services that we haven't been able to see before because of this technology. And I think it's going to happen uh, within the next five to 10 years. So thank you for your time. I'll be around for a while and uh, look forward to chatting.